Con más de 30 años de experiencia en el área comercial, fungiendo desde vendedor, director de ventas, hasta vicepresidente de una compañía de la industria alimenticia, Jeffrey Lipsius es actualmente el director del Juego Interior de Liderazgo de Ventas con Timothy Galway en la corporación El Juego Interior. Es también uno de los pocos entrenadores certificados en el modelo Inner Game. Autor del libro Selling to the Point, en español, La Clave de la Venta, Jeffrey ha entrenado a cientos de vendedores y entrenadores en ventas bajo su modelo centrado en el comprador. El día de hoy nos acompaña para divulgar con el público hispanoparlante sobre su manera particular de articular el juego interior de Tim Galway con la actividad de las ventas. Como una atención para nuestro invitado, la entrevista será hecha en inglés a partir de este momento. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Yes, Luis, thank you very much for having me. Jeffrey, please tell us about the story of how you met Tim and the inner game. Uh, as I understand by reading uh, the first part of your book, you've already read the inner game by then, the inner game of tennis, the first Timothy Galway uh, book. And after graduating, uh, you had the chance to meet Tim at the conference. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Well, uh, I was a tennis player and read the inner game of tennis and was just really struck by the insights and saw this as a key to being a way that I could improve my performance in just about anything I could pursue. Um, if people aren't familiar with Tim Galway, by the way, my, my mentor in this process, um, he's known as the father of modern coaching. And Tim Galway came out with his book called The Inner Game of Tennis, which was one of the best-selling books on coaching and uh, performance ever. And what's interesting about the inner game of tennis is that by and large, most of the people that read the book and uh, enjoyed the book very much weren't tennis players because he's talking about peak performance and using tennis just as a metaphor. But the same principles that apply for peak performance in tennis apply for peak performance in anything you would pursue. So this is what got me so excited. I saw the, the possibility of this method. And uh, I, I didn't make it in the pros as a tennis player. <laughs> uh, and that I, I became a, a salesperson. And I met Tim at a conference and was talking to him about some of his ideas regarding inner game and how it might apply to selling. And he had a lot of good insights because he's been working for some big companies, AT&T and Coca-Cola and uh, Rolls-Royce were uh, some of his big clients. And as time went on, I rose in the ranks of my company and became vice president of the entire uh, sales and marketing department of this company. I had over 100 salespeople under me and I had a chance to meet with Tim again. This time I said to Tim, <laughs> uh, hey, if we, work to apply inner game to my sales force. We could use my sales force as a laboratory and see how these principles actually play out. And that really excited Tim because inner game is about learning from experience. So Tim and I started on this journey of talking about inner game and selling and sales performance and uh, how it's working with my sales force. And then I would come back to him. And over the course of several years, we really worked it out, but we're the point where I uh, wrote my book and started training sales forces with Tim full time. And it's been very exciting. Let me ask you a couple of questions, Jeff. Um, how old were you when you first met Tim? And then how long or how much time did it um, pass until you had this second encounter <laughs> with when you offered him uh, the opportunity to work with your uh, sales force? Yeah, that, well, I first met Tim in 1973. So uh, that would make me uh, 20 years old. <laughs> I met him and it was actually a meditation conference. And uh, I didn't meet him again until I became a salesperson. It must have been uh, 10 years later. But I never lost the spark of inner game and what the potential for applying that could hold. So I just you know, kept, uh, kept the thing going inside of me whenever I would have another chance to see Tim again and talk to him about the insights, just you know, take full advantage of that moment. 
Well, he was my, it's interesting, you know, you talk about inner and outer, okay? And what Tim's basically saying is that, you know, you have an outer game, which is what you're doing on the outside, but then there's also an inner component, which is your, your feelings, your thoughts. And Louise, you might ask me, oh, well, how many years was it between uh, seeing Tim the first time and then seeing him the second time? Well, that's outer, (laughs) my meetings with Tim. And the important point, which I think is a theme that's going to run through this entire interview, on the inside, Tim never left. Okay. On the inside, I, I was very devoted to the inner game path, even though I only met Tim once every 10 years. It was constantly with me on the inside, which is what mattered because I was in touch with it on the inside when the opportunity presented itself on the outside. I was able to recognize it and seize it, which is what this interview is all about. Of course. And if 10 years passed in the outer game, but in the inner game, he never left. What would you say was so captivating about Tim or his speech that uh, left such an impression on you? Uh, Yeah, Tim had a way of getting right to the goal of things, you know, what really matters. And of course, that's important in coaching. When you're coaching a client, the first thing you want to do is say, "Well, well, what's their goal? And really make sure the client is clear on the goals. Without that, a coach isn't really able to help them. And Tim was very good at figuring out the goal. That's the first part. The second part, is Tim's identifying interference to the goal. And it turns out that interference to the goal pretty much all the time is based in ego, okay? So one of the first goals Tim ever identified in inner game is that the goal of teaching is learning, okay? Now, Teaching is outer and learning is inner. There are two different levels. You can have learning without teaching and you could have teaching without learning. So when Tim saw, oh, the goal of teaching is really learning, it brought a clarity, then why teach? (laughs) If all you want is the learning, why not just focus on the goal, focus on the learning? And if you ever saw Tim give a tennis lesson, he doesn't give a single instruction. And because he didn't give a single instruction, the student learned in an accelerated way. You could teach, Tim can teach somebody, uh, a beginner, a forehand, a backhand, and a serve in a half hour's time that would, in a traditional tennis lesson that involved teaching would take months for the student to get as proficient in the forehand and backhand and serve as Tim can do in about a half an hour. It it was amazing. I I just couldn't believe it that actually teaching can interfere with learning, but that's the beauty of being clear on the goal. So I knew that Tim had the answer. What would it be in selling? since that was my profession. And it was so simple when he told me. He said, well, very simply, the goal of selling is buying. So why focus on your selling, right? A salesperson's commission check, the size of the commission check is not the result of their selling, it's the result of the customer's buying. And in fact, selling can interfere with buying. Now, remember I talked about ego, okay? If we get back to my, the goal is learning, not teaching example, the ego comes in because the teacher wants to be able to take credit for what the student did. I mean, if you're, if somebody learns tennis 
without you giving any instructions, what did they need you for, <laughs> right? And in fact, when you think about it from the standpoint of being a good coach, you don't want the student to think that they need you. You want them to have, you want to instill self-confidence in, in that student. So if the student doesn't think they need you, you've been a good coach. That might not be so good for your business. You know, it might be better for your business if the student think, oh, I need you or I can't play tennis as well. But that's, that's not the goal. <laughs> it's not the goal to make the student dependent on you. Of course, it's so simple and so elegant that it sounds almost like impossible, right? Like the purpose is not to teach, is for the student to learn. Well, in selling, it's not the purpose is not for me to sell anything, but the buyer to, in fact, buy. And that's when you uh, make all, all of these observations into a book calling, called Selling, selling to, a, to the Point, right? Yes, yes. Tell yeah, us well, about that. That, yeah, well, that's, that's why the book is called Selling to the Point, because the point of selling is buying. So the salesperson's focus needs to be on the customer's buying performance, not the salesperson's selling performance. Now, if we get back to ego, yeah, a, a salesperson who's ego-based is obviously going to want to focus on their selling performance because they're one who's going to be able to take credit for what they said, right? They want to know that they, they said something good that, uh, you know, made their thinking prevail over the customer's thinking. Well, that, that's ego. But when you do that, you're changing the focus from inner, which is the customer's decision process, to outer, which is what you're telling the customer. Well, selling is not about what the salesperson says, right? I mean, if, if selling was about salesperson people saying the right things, then everybody would be a salesperson, right? It could be the world's easiest profession. You just say these things and you get commission. It's not that easy because you have a customer decision process that you also have to work with. And that's where the salesperson's focus needs to be on, the customer's decision-making. Uh, it's not about what a salesperson says. It's about how the salesperson responds. Let me jump in again. Yeah. So yeah. The, the ego component is uh, very important to understand your method, right? So could you... Uh, um, be more, more explore more about the, the ego concept. What do you mean by the ego, and what would be the the contrary? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, when I'm talking about ego, and actually in Tim's books, he doesn't really talk about ego. What he talks about is trying and judging. Okay. So, if you have a, uh, a tennis player who happens to be frustrated with how they're playing at the moment and you see them talking to themselves. Oh, come on, stupid, hit the ball the right way. They're, go up to them and say, I just heard you talking. Who were you talking to? They would say, well, I was just talking to myself. Okay, so that's two selves. You have, I am talking to myself, all right? Who's doing the judging? Well, I am. Who's doing the tennis playing? Myself. Well, they're not, they're not in sync because for the judger to think that the myself, that the, the body is, is stupid and not doing the right thing is really underestimating the, the beauty of how our body works in unison to hit a tennis ball. It's very complicated, no PhD in physiology could describe all the things that are involved in just hitting a forehand, especially within the split seconds of, of a ball coming at you. How can you call that stupid? But we do. It's frustration. It's based upon judgment that 
things are supposed to go a certain way. We're, we're supposed to hit the ball a certain way. And what Tim is saying is, is just redefine that goal from judgment to isness. Notice how things go the way they are. Instead of saying the ball went out, just say it went over there. Okay. The ball doesn't go in or out. The ball goes over there or over there. And the more accurately you could notice what's happening in the moment with the tennis ball, the more you're going to allow your body to make the different adjustments it needs to learn and improve without a teacher. See, with the, the internal judger that's acting like a teacher and you need to be a learner. Now in sales, the tennis ball is the customer. <laughs> to, to the salesperson, the, the tennis ball is the customer and where the ball bounces is the customer's decision process. Okay, so paying attention to the customer's decision process in a non-judgmental way is going to give the salespeople the information they need in order to respond better to that customer. And if the salesperson is judging, uh, am I influencing them? Is I taking control of the conversation? Do the customer think I'm smart? Does the customer like me? Does the customer trust me? The salesperson's distracted from where the ball is landing. Instead of the ball landing out, you know, the customer doesn't trust me. Well, what are they? How do they trust you? Or better yet, and this is the crux of my technique, turn your thinking around. Does the customer trust themselves? Ah, now you've changed the conversation from outer to inner. You've changed the conversation from does the customer trust the salesperson that's outer to does the customer have self-trust, which is inner. Now think about this. If the customer has self-doubt in their ability to make a good decision, then they can't trust themselves to decide if they can trust the salesperson. <laughs> the salesperson won't get trust, not because of anything the salesperson did, but because of the customer's self-doubt. Now, if you're a coach and you're dealing with a performer that has self-doubt, you have to address that. And for example, self-doubt is gonna hurt a customer's decision process. For example, a customer may make an inappropriately conservative decision because they have self-doubt. And the salesperson has to work with that. Salespeople are their customers' decision coaches. And this is where sales and coaching come in. Great. Okay. So could we go into some examples, please? For example, what would be some of the actions that maybe some sales people that are, let's say, sales-centered or ego-centered would do in opposition to salespeople that are centered on the buying process on the client? Okay, so uh, I'll give you an interesting example. Um, and it has all has to do with observation. You have to know your customer. Um, when I was in high school, now I'm an old guy, so seatbelts just came out. And the school wanted to get the students, we were all new drivers, we were 16 years old, to start wearing our seatbelts. And nobody was, and students were getting in accidents, and they were getting banged up. Now you could imagine you're gonna be talking to 16 year old boys about driving safety and you've got hormones and everything else. How are they going to get students to use their seatbelts? Well, they knew their customer. So in, they brought us into an assembly into the school theater. We were all there. 
And instead of showing us movies of accident victims with blood in the street and everything else that they usually would do, they brought in a race car driver. And this race car driver started talking about, and we heard of him, he was, he was well known, how the American team won the Grand Prix because they wore their seatbelts. What happened is the, the European team and the other teams didn't wear seatbelts because they thought seatbelts were going to restrict the driver. But in fact, the, the American team discovered that the seatbelts helped to secure and stabilize the driver so they could drive, uh, have more control at higher speeds. Well, this was music to the ears of a 16-year-old boy. You know, I put on my seatbelt, I could drive even faster. And I did, I put on my seatbelt and yeah, I did feel more secure when I drove the car fast and I wore my seatbelt ever since. You know, it's a matter of observing your customer. So what I say to salespeople, you know, how to get them out of that judgmental role is inner game one-on-one, -on -one. <laughs> you know, a basic inner game. You are the learner, not the teacher. The salesperson is the learner, not the teacher, okay? Now, it might be very stressful to be a salesperson, to feel like you need to be in control of the customer's decision process. That's stressful because you have no control over the customer's decision process. Uh, people are gonna think whatever they think, and if you're responsible for what they think, that would stress me out. But what if you redefine your role that you are going to be the learner? And in whatever interaction you have, you're going to commit to learning as much as you can from that interaction. Then you never lose. Then you've always won because the salesperson is in total control of what they learn. Now, I'll tell you a personal story. Uh, the insight, the, the biggest insight that I have when it came to writing my book, Selling to the Point and uh, Inner Game, came from a sale that I lost. Okay. And what happened was I was talking to this customer and I was really proud to say that I went back to my manager and lowered the price. So I have the lowest price now in the category for this product. When I presented it to the customer, he got really angry that I presented such a low price and said, well, you must be using the cheapest raw materials. And he slammed the door in my face. I was like, very unexpected response. But instead of judging it, I said, okay, well, what can I learn from this? And what I learned is that, you know what? This customer and me are speaking two different languages. That in my language, low price meant good value. But in the customer's language, low price means poor quality. And I have to learn his language because his language is what's gonna prevail in the outcome, in the decision process. And that was the big insight that it got into my book that, hey, every sale involves two conversations. Conversation A, between the salesperson and the customer, which is outer, and conversation B, which is the conversation going on between the customer's ears that we call decision-making. And they're two entirely different conversations. So the point I'm making is that I got that insight from a sale that I lost. Am I sorry I lost that sale? No, I'm glad because it became the birth of an entire career in sales training and being able to reach people with this message through my book. Great, Jeffrey. And now that we are getting technical, let's say, um, please tell us about the sales application of the P equals P minus I formula from the inner game. Yeah, this is, this is Tim Galway's most famous formula. It's taught in every single coaching school in the country, I mean, in the world, uh, P equals P minus I. And P on the 
left side of the equation stands for performance. So what he's basically saying is performance equals the potential minus the interference. Okay. So, um, you know, a simple example of if it's tennis playing, okay, uh, somebody's performance on the court is going to equal uh, their potential as a tennis player minus the interference, which could be their self-doubt or their lack of self-awareness or, uh, you know, whatever might be interfering. We are trying too hard, all these different things that might interfere with their performance. So in sales, performance is the customer's decision performance, right? Because as I'm saying, the goal of selling is buying. So the P is performance is the customer's decision performance, the quality of the decision that the customer makes equals the customer's potential for making a good decision minus the interference. Now here's, this is, I, I changed the salesperson's thinking from outer to inner, okay? When we say that potential minus the interference, okay? What's the source of interference? Is it the salesperson or the customer? Well, the source of interference is inner. It's the customer. The customer uh, imposes interferences to their own decision-making potential. So I gave one example, which was self-doubt. You know, if the customer has self-doubt, then it's going to negatively impact their potential for making a good decision. Another example of the customer's self-imposed interference to decision-making would be self-limiting beliefs, which is again, something that coaches deal with all the time. This is why I'm saying that salesperson is the customer's decision coach. You know, because when a customer has a self-limiting belief, they could love the product and wanna buy the product, but not empower themselves to actually buy it. It's very frustrating for salespeople when you convince them it's a great product and they still don't wanna buy it, but because they have a self-limiting belief that, you know, I don't have it in the budget or I have to talk to my partner or um, I, I don't think I can afford it right now. And salespeople have to deal with this. The third is a lack of self-awareness, which is simply when a customer is not clear about their goal, which salespeople miss this all the time. If you ever see a salesperson who's talking about the features of their product and the customer looks bored and the customer's yawning and the customer's hardly paying attention, well, why is that? It's interference. The customer doesn't know what they need. They don't have a clear goal. And if the customer doesn't know what they need on the inside, then how are they gonna know how the features of your product will satisfy that need? The features of your product are on the outside, but as a salesperson, you haven't established the inside first, which is the customer's need awareness. And so you're not gonna get anywhere with the outer, the product's features until you've established the inner. So these are examples of uh, self-imposed interference from the customer. It kept me thinking, in, in your training courses uh, and when you train other trainers or sales uh, forces, what, what are the, the recommendations, the usual tips or um, suggestions you, you made that may, maybe for the audience here, will uh, click with them that, yes, this is so simple. I just have to switch this simple thing, but you know, like very down to earth, not, not so very conceptual. Like, uh, do you have any suggestions, like practical suggestions? Well, know where your ball is bouncing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, pay, pay attention to the customer without judging them. Instead, you wanna learn from them. See, the, the, you wanna look at it this way. The customer is always going to be the salesperson's best teacher. 
the most that a sales trainer like me can do is show salespeople how they can learn how to learn from their customers. I'm just going to show people how to learn from their customers better. Okay. Uh, when you try really hard to achieve a goal, it, it's going to backfire. Because peak performance, you could say it's performing beyond expectations. Well, you can't expect to perform beyond your expectations, right? It's by definition, you're going to sabotage the process. And it's the same thing, whether it's trying, trying hard to sell or trying hard to do anything. If I'm trying to sleep, am I sleeping? If I'm trying to study, am I studying? If I'm trying to like you, do I like you? I mean, how does it sound when I say, well, I'm trying to like you right now? <laughs> it doesn't sound very good because it means you don't like me. And that's what salespeople are doing all the time is trying to like their customer. Well, it means they don't. So you get out of trying mode and you, and you redefine it as a learning mode. And learning happens without, without judgment. Great. Let us explore some other territories. And the territory I'm interested in is coaching in general. Mm -hmm. So let's begin by how would you define coaching? Well, uh, coaching is uh, assisting somebody in achieving their objectives. Do you make a parallel between coaching and training? Are those the same uh, words or is coaching different than training? Yeah, coaching is, is different than training. Yeah, coaching is strictly inner. You know, like I said before, if, if you're going to be coaching a tennis player and you really want to be a coach, you're going to convince them that they don't need you anymore because you're enhancing their self-confidence, that the answers lie within them. Whereas in training, you know, it's more about, you know, skill set and information and there's some, you know, teaching that needs to happen. So, uh, yeah, training and coaching is definitely different. I'll say in sales in particular, I hear a lot of things in traditional sales training that are just so wrong. <laughs> One of them is to be your customer's trusted advisor. So if I talk to any sales trainer or any sales coach right now, and the, the philosophy, the um, instruction to the salespeople they give is, you want to play the role of the salesperson's trusted advisor. Well, no, <laughs> uh, that's not coaching, that's advising. And I would definitely say in the role of a salesperson, Coaching is superior because you need to gain the customer's self-trust in their ability to make an autonomous decision without you. Because the chances of a salesperson actually getting a customer to say, oh, okay, you know best. So what's your advice for me? It's never, it's, it's not really going to penetrate into the customer's beliefs and values because it's outer. And as I said, the buying process is inner. The decision process is inner. So coaching is strictly dealing with the internal environment of the customer, their beliefs, their values, their goals, their objectives, challenges. Uh, okay. This is, yeah. So there's a clear difference between training and coaching. This is important for us Latin Americans or Hispanic yeah. uh, speaking people because when we try to tra translate coaching in Spanish, it's also training, right? There's no distinction between coaching and training. Both of them yeah. in Spanish are entrenar, let's say. Uh -huh. And there's a story, there's an anecdote that when John Whitmore uh, wrote coaching for performance, in Spanish, they translated as training for performance. And he was very mad about it. And he yeah. said, no, it's not yeah. training, it's coaching. Yeah, yeah, well, there, there's a, now there's nothing wrong with training. There's a place for training, mm -hmm. very important. It's just that we shouldn't mix those two up. You're, you're definitely right. They're, they're two entirely different things. Yeah, so are there any differences between 
the inner game and coaching? Uh, well, inner game actually defined coaching. Inner game really defined what coaching was, uh, you know, which is helping people discover their own inner potential and empowering people to discover uh, their, their inner potential. Uh, th there's a difference between creating and discovering that's very important to know about coaching. And I think before inner game came out, people thought more of coaching in terms of what they want to create. Uh, that you, you come up with, with an idea and you make it happen. And when Tim's book came out, it was more about discovery. Okay, well, maybe there's even a greater possibility that you're not aware of yet. So, Let's explore your full potential and trust that the answer is going to emerge during that process, which was a whole nother level. And actually showing people how they could do that, first on the ten tennis court and then in, in so many other areas. I mean, he's got books on stress reduction and music. And, golf, uh, golf. Yes, it's all a series of books now, uh, but applying the basic same principles. And, and of course, uh, his, one of his best books, The, the Inner Game of Work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I have yeah. One. yeah. Yeah. And, and Jeff, do you see any differences? I, I remember you saying that the first time you met Tim was in the 70s, 73, I think yeah, you said. Yeah. You were 20 something. Do you see mm -hmm. any differences between uh, that kind of coaching or, or the coaching at those times and the coaching that has exploded all over the world right now, is it any different or is it, is it the same thing? Yeah, it's different. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, Tim, of course, wrote the best-selling tennis book ever. And he's considered, you know, really responsible for bringing tennis into the forefront in terms of, of coaching and popularity of the sport. In Here in America, we have what's called the Tennis Channel on our television, which is a uh, cable television network that's completely dedicated to 24-hour tennis. You watch tennis constantly, there's a tennis match. You could turn it on and watch uh, professionals playing tennis all the time, every day, 24 hours. And they do different shows about tennis. They didn't want anything to do with Tim Galloway. They actually a couple times had approached the tennis channel and they were just not interested in interviewing Tim Galloway or even talking about what he had to say. Why, why was that? He's one of the most best known people in the game. It turns out recently, just a few years ago, they admitted to him well, we were avoiding you because we saw you as a threat to the tennis teaching field. Because the inner game is so simple. You, you really don't have to be an, an expert in technical tennis to be able to help someone else learn. And so we have all these certification programs for tennis instructors. And what you're saying is, those things aren't necessary because you're bypassing teaching. <laughs> you don't need to teach. There's even a, a famous video, the Risner Report by Harvey Risner. Yeah. yeah. Right? That yeah. They, they um, came up with a challenge for, for Tim that if he could teach without you teaching, using the, the Tim Galloway method, as they called it back then, yeah. not the inner game. And then with this uh, woman, middle-aged woman called Molly, and it was a yeah. huge success, right? Yeah, yes. Well, yeah, that, that's the point is that they had, um, they had Tim doing a tennis lesson without any teaching. You could see how that would be threatening to a tennis teacher who just went through this academy to get certified as a tennis teacher, knowing all the technicalities and Tim comes around and says, well, you don't need to teach. So <laughs> yeah. this gets back to your question, what do I see that's wrong with coaching now? Uh -huh. What I see that's wrong with coaching is that, you know, the coach wants to be 
very important. And the coach wants to be able to teach and they want to be able to have influence with the client. And it's maybe it's good job security to get the client to think that they need their coach in order to succeed. But so, the real inner game coaching is about empowering the client to discover their own potential. And so I see that. I, I, I'm sorry, Jeff, but I, I was caught up with that. Would you say that some somewhere along the way, the, the meaning and the essence of coaching got, you know, like distorted yeah. from this inner game perspective yeah. Yeah. and discovering to, let's say, something more like training? And giving yeah, advice I, and, and being yeah. like a guru-like being? Yeah, I, I would say that's the case. And as a matter of fact, the linguistics in Spanish is a great example where there isn't even a different term. <laughs> Training and coaching is the same word. Yeah. They're two different things. Why is it the same word? Mm -hmm. Because when there's a, a business model involved, when there's a personal ego of the coach involved, it's going to mix the two. Yeah, so, so paradoxically, let's say there are lots of coaches nowadays, but focused on themselves, not on the client. You know, there, I mean, there's a range. You know, there, uh, there are some coaches that are very client focused. I'm sure you know, many good coaches that are very client focused. There are also people that call themselves coaches that are more self-focused. And then, of course, there's a continuum everywhere in between. Uh, I just think that the field of coaching in general needs to really be more clear that it's about empowering the client only. And do you have any idea where it got distorted? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, But over the course of time, I think, uh, you know, the inner game craze kind of left and other people started talking about inner game without really understanding what it was. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody came out with a book called The Inner Game of Selling, and it's completely wrong from a coaching Tim Galway standpoint, where it's It's all about the salesperson, not the customer. And so the book talks about the salesperson's mindset rather than the customer's mindset. But this is how people misunderstand what the term inner game is. One of the first things that Tim described to me when I was talking to him about, well, how would you apply inner game to selling? He said to me, Jeff, there's one thing you have to know. The inner game is really the outer game, and the outer game is really the inner game. That was a mouthful for me, but then he went on to explain, and it made perfect sense. When you watch Tim give a tennis lesson, he's not teaching. He's asking the student to pay attention to things like where the ball bounces. Notice the shape of your swing. Uh, watch the seams of the ball. Say bounce when the ball bounces and hit when it hits your racket. Okay. Where the ball bounces is outer. So he's getting the student to pay attention outer in order to achieve the inner focus and awareness that the student needs. If Tim tried to apply inner game by going inner, He would say something to the tennis player like, well, it's your self-doubt. Your self-doubt is interfering with your ability to handle that shot. So you need to be more confident. Okay, that's inner. But it wouldn't work because the student would start judging whether they're trying too hard and judging whether they're judging too much. And you wouldn't get an improvement in the actual performance. So the inner game is actually outer. And I think once you know people started taking the mantle of inner game and, and applying it without really talking to Tim and taking the time to understand, 
how inner game is applied. I, I think that's when the coaching industry kind of went the wrong way to more of a training model and teaching model. Jeffrey, um, yes. we're getting close to the end of our talk. Please yeah, tell us about your question. partnership with Tim and the Inner Game Corporation. Yeah, well, uh, I train sales forces for Tim. Sometimes Tim and I train them together. Other times I'm out on my own, uh, you know, working on behalf of the uh, Inner Game resources to uh, train sales forces using the Inner Game method. So you know, a lot of people call in and check in with Tim, you know, that are business people. And, you know, Tim suggests, what about selling? Do you think that's an area of performance that your company could improve upon? And they say, yeah, <laughs> we'd love to have better sales. And um, so Tim gives me their number. We get together and uh, do sales trainings. Uh, we're seeing big sales increases with these companies. 15 to 20% is uh, pretty average, which is way beyond what traditional sales training courses can do because we're really focused on the goal, which is the customer's buying performance. So uh, I have two books. Um, these are my books. It's actually the, the same. This is the English version, Selling to the Point, uh, forward by Tim Galway. And then this is the Spanish version, uh, Clave de Naventa. And uh, they're available on Amazon. Great. And um, finally, how can people reach you and know about your trainings and, of course, buy your yeah. books? Yeah, well, you could uh, email me. My email address is jeffrey.lipsius at gmail.com. Uh, we have the innergame.com website, which has a uh, page on sales leadership that describes the course and describes the application of inner game principles to selling. Uh, and, you know, if you get in touch with me, I'd be glad to talk to anybody that uh, contacts me. I have uh, many more materials, videos, things that, that I could send to help somebody with their own selling situation or better understanding of, of inner game coaching. Great, Jeffrey. Well, it was such a pleasure to talk to you, to know you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And let's thank hope you. this thank message you. gets all over um, sp Spanish speaking uh, people interested in coaching and both in uh, sales also. Yes, well, that would be great. Yes, thank you, Louise, very much for having me, asking me to talk about my favorite subject. I uh, greatly appreciate it and uh, hope to hear from people as a result of this, this video. So thank you very much for the interview. For sure, it was fun. Thank you. Okay. Till thank next you. time. Okay.